as we have seen, and I'm going to do a quick uh, a timeline for you, just so that, that you can get your minds to where we are. Uh, the, within the uh, revelation, you have three main categories of judgments that are poured out. Uh, in the beginning, we found that there was the opening of the seal judgments, and this is as Christ was handed the scroll and he opened up a seal. And as he opened the seal and so opened the scroll, uh, the first, uh, the, the, there were the seven seals that were opened, and the seventh seal gave way to seven trumpet judgments. And as each trumpet was blown, a various judgment was given forth. And as the seventh trumpet was blown, we then saw seven vials or seven bowls. It's more like a shallow saucer, if you would. And that's where we pick up today is the seven vials or bowls are the, the final judgment or the last judgment. This is the completion of the judgments in this tribulation period. And so chapter 16 is where we find the actual pouring out of these final judgments. And chapter 16 is really going to end uh, with these words, it is done. Uh, the judgment has now been poured out. But then we're going to kind of take a step back in chapter 17 and chapters 18 and look at the destruction of Babylon and so on. But let me go with you through these uh, seven um, uh, bowl judgments or vile judgments, whatever terminology you choose to use this morning, really makes no difference to me. As long as we understand this, that this is the supernatural judgment of God. There are many liberal students today that want to try to uh, use science and uh, various other ways to say, well, this is all natural phenomenon, that this is man. Man has ruined uh, the, the um, environment to the point that these things will happen. Uh, no, no, no. This is supernatural. Uh, this is the supernatural uh, outpouring of the wrath of God. However he chooses to do that, um, that is, that's, that's up to him. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't uh, propose to know uh, how he's going to do that, but it is God's judgment being poured out upon sinful men. This is God fulfilling what he said when he said that he will avenge. He is going to pour out his wrath. This is the day of the Lord. This is after the rapture of the church or the catching away of the church. We have the saints in heaven and we have the tribulation, that seven-year tribulation period. We're now in the end part of the tribulation, that final time preparing for the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Christ when that battle will be fought. So let me read to you chapter 16 of the, Revel of the Revelation. Then, I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go, pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The second angel poured out his bowl on the earth, and it turned into blood like that of a, ma a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. The third angel poured out his bowl on the river and the springs of the earth, and they became blood. Then I heard the angel in, the, in charge of the waters say, you are just in these judgments. You are you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, yes, Lord God, Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. And they were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. Men gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. 
The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the, of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And they were spirits of demons performing miraculous signs. And they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle on the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him so that he may not go naked and be ashamedly sorry, shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings together in the place that is Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, it is done. Then there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great, the great city split into three parts and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the, vi the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away and mountains could not be found. From Sky, huge hailstones of about a hundred pounds each fell upon men, and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail, because the plague was so terrible. Wow. This is the final judgment of God. Now, there have been those that have proposed that this is a looking back or a going back to the previous uh, the previous judgments of God. And it's just looking back at when the sea was turned into blood. Remember that? It was spoken of the sea was turned to blood and a third of the sea and a third of the living creatures and a third of the ships and a third of the, the, uh, the fresh water. You'll remember that, the previous judgments that was found in the trumpet judgments. Uh, I don't agree with that because here... Uh, for various reasons, it is spoken that all of the sea, uh, that was a third. This is spoken of all of the sea, all of the fresh water. And also the fourth one that speaks of the scorching of the sun is not spoken of before. And so you do not really see a correlation. So this is not looking back and it had happened. Uh, this is a new set of judgment. And it is called the last judgment, the fulfilling of it. How do we know that it is the last judgment? Well, it's very easy to know that because when you go back to the previous chapter, specifically uh, chapter number 15 and verse 1, when he said, I saw in heaven another great and mar marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last, there it is, last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is complete. So this is the last, this is the, the end, this is the, the, the final judgment. Uh, it is the last. This is not those that preceded it, this is the final. This is now the rapid fire judgment, pow, pow, just straight after each other, God pouring out his wrath. Now notice in verse 1, chapter 16, I'm just going to take you through verse for verse because I think that that does justice to God's Word. We want to know what God has to say, so we have to stay with God's Word. We're not here for a philosophy uh, lesson. We're here just to hear what God's Word has to say. Amen? So let's do that. Let's just stay with the Word. And so verse 1 said, I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. So what do we learn from that? These, these bowls are what? God's wrath. Very easy to learn from that. And it was a voice coming from the temple. Whose voice is this? Uh, there are those that have said, well, this is a voice of a great angel. Others have said, this is great voices of those that have gone ahead of us. No, this is the voice of God. How do you know that? Well, just go to the passage before that. If you would go there with me and look at the final verse of chapter number 15, chapter, uh, chapter 15, verse 8, says, And the temple was filled with smoke, and the glory of God, and from His power, and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels was complete. So who's in the temple? 
God. No one can be in the temple, but God. Now they hear a voice coming out of the temple. Whose voice is this? God. So this is God's voice, and he is commanding the angels to pour out his wrath upon the people. So verse 2 says, now the first angel went, and he poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly, painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. So here we see this um, bowl being poured out, and the judgment falls directly on the people. Which people? All the people? No, there's a clarification given here. Only those that received the mark of the beast. Well, where have we seen that? Well, we have seen that back in uh, chapter number 13 and chapter number 14. Do you remember that? That is where the false prophet led them to bow down to the image of the beast and they had to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead in order to be able to purchase. This mark was known as the mark of the beast, and this number was 666. Those that would not receive this mark, those were the ones who were beheaded or persecuted. They were killed. Who were those that were killed, persecuted, beheaded? They were the ones that had a different mark on them. They were the ones that had the mark of God on them. They are the ones whose names were written in the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb who was sacrificed before the foundation of the world. And so this is not source, God pouring out judgment upon his own people. This is God pouring out judgment on rejectors, people who have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. As you read these words, painful sores, the idea here is uh, on him pouring out sores that are oozing malignant sores. The words that are used are the same words that we would use today um, for malignancy. Those of you who have ever gone for tests of maybe a, a, a sore and you've said, preacher, please pray for me. We hope it's not malignant. You know, in other words, that, that it is, it's not cancerous. In other words, we're hoping that it has a cure, that it's, it's not bad. The, the words that are used just speak of that which is malignant, that which is so painful and oozing that it is untreatable. And so God pours out upon them that judgment. And this is just a temporary judgment a temporary judgment. They have rejected Christ. And it's temporary in the fact that the body's being affected and the body's going to die. It's a temporary judgment upon them. But, but there is an eternal judgment that awaits them. How do you know that? Well, well go back to chapter 15, 14. You've got your Bibles open, so it's very easy now. Just go one, two chapters back, chapter 14, and I, I want you specifically to look at verses 9 through 11 with me. And now we're looking at those that received the mark, right? Because they are the ones that are getting the sores. Now, in chapter number 14, verse 9 says, A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on their forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and his image or for anyone who receives the mark of his name." That's powerful. That is very powerful. That this judgment that we see here and we're like, wow, that judgment of sores. Can you imagine being covered from head to toes with malignant oozing sores that are so painful? But then you think, what is that in comparison to what is to come for them? And for what reason? Because they would not pledge allegiance to Christ. They would pledge their allegiance to Satan. 
Now let's go back to chapter 16 and verse 3. So now here comes the second bowl. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it turned into blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. Now notice if the sea turns into blood, but it's not just blood. It is blood like that of a dead man. How do I explain blood like that of a dead man? I'm trying to think of, of a not so graphic way. I guess the most less graphic way is when I was living with Leilani's parents. Um, they, they owned a farm and uh, her dad used to slaughter the pigs and the... And the uh, uh, cows and, and all that kind of stuff and they would cut their throats and they would drain the blood and the slaughter area became an area of congealed thick jelly like blood not runny but jelly so can you imagine the sea turning into jelly-like blood. When we lived in a place called uh, Cape Agullis, which is the most southerly tip of Africa, there was something that we experienced not very often, but at certain times, and it was called red tide. Have you ever heard of something called red tide? Have you ever smelt red tide? It's terrible. Um, uh, and, and when red tide would take place, and I don't, uh, don't uh, suppose to know exactly what red tide is, all I know is when red tide took place, the shores would be absolutely covered in every kind of dead fish, shellfish, you name it, would be covered. I mean, knee deep. They would just wash ashore. And you could not eat that stuff. It, they, they would literally come with, with front-end loaders and lift it up and take it to be burnt as they would try to clean the shoreline. And, and this would just happen. This is going to be a red tide like you've never seen in your life before. Now think of how much of the earth, where's my, I hid it away. James hid my, my prop away. Um, how much of this earth is covered in sea? Two-thirds of the earth is covered in sea. Can you imagine the effects of two-thirds of the earth covered in congealed blood? So the third angel, verse 4, poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Are you starting to see a, a terrible picture of what's about to take place before the second coming of Christ? Where are we in our timeline is here the, the rapture of the church has taken place. In heaven, you've had the, the Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ. You've had the, the um, marriage supper of the Lamb taken place. Here on earth, you're in a, a seven-year tribulation period. And where are you? You're in what's known as the great tribulation, which is in the final three and a half years, more toward the end of that three and a half year time, waiting for the second coming of Christ. So here we find in this verse that the fresh water now also becomes like blood. And there's almost like a, a, a parenthetical passage here, almost like a pause, verse 5. And then I heard the angel in charge of the water say, you are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One. Uh, it's almost as if one would step away and say, Lord, what are you doing? It's almost as if one would, would put your, 
your, your, your head in your hands and say, what kind of God is this? Lord, how can you turn two-thirds of the earth into dead man's blood? Lord, how can you change these people that they would be filled with sores? Now, the fresh water that they need to cleanse themselves is blood. What kind of God is this? And it's almost like God knows. And he says, you are just in these judgments. You are just. You see, let's never lose sight of this. For the wages of sin is death. That these ones have received repeated, repeated, repeated exhortations to turn, turn, turn. They have heard the word of the prophets. They've heard the word of the evangelists. They've heard the word of the church. They, they've now heard the, the, the angel that was flying. You remember that? It was calling out the eternal gospel. They have heard the two witnesses calling out the gospel. They have heard the word of the 144,000 evangelists calling them back. They have seen a great revival taken place, and they are still cursing God. How do you know they're cursing God? Well, look what's about to take place. I'm going to read this passage, and then I'm going to come back. You are just in his judgment, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged, for they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets. You have given them blood to drink, here's the key, as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. And as you drop your eyes further down, look at verse number nine. They were seared by intense heat and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent. So now let's go back and I want to grab this nugget just for a moment and play with it just a, a bit if you would allow me to. Here's the nugget. You are just in these judgments. Go to Romans chapter 12 and verse 19 with me, if you would. It says, do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 through 31, is a passage that I'm sure they wish that they had heeded. If we, de if we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and who has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. They are experiencing exactly that. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But notice the terms that are used here. You're just. You who are and who were. You see, this is not just some mamby-pamby God. <laughs> this is not some God who is a created being. He is the one who is the eternal God. The one that knows no beginning and knows no end. He is the God of absolute independence. He is the Holy One. 
He is the God who is above all else. The God removed, sanctified, different from all else. He is that God that is beyond what we can ever begin to imagine. He is the God who is holy and righteous. His standard is a standard of perfection. Boy, isn't it great that he has provided that perfection through his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And he holds out this grace and says, repent, turn to me. And yet they would not repent. And so he's also the God of justice. And he judges those that refuse to turn to him. But notice now it says in verse 6, that he is just for they have shed the blood of your saints and your prophets. Therefore, you have given them the blood to drink as they deserve. Now, notice this verse is a great verse. Verse 7. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. I heard what respond? The altar respond. When I read that, I was like, the altar respond, where? Have I heard that before? Commentators differ in their, 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 their interpretation of that. I believe that the answer is found if you go back to chapter 6, chapter number 6, verse number 9, when the fifth seal is opened. When the fifth seal is opened, I remember the fifth seal is the, the great persecution of the, the, the believers in the tribulation, those, those ones that come to Christ in the tribulation and, and are persecuted in the tribulation. Verse nine says, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony that they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, how long sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. Now go to chapter seven, verse number nine. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. This is the same people. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Drop your eyes down further now. Verse 13, one of the elders asked me, these in the white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God. They serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. So now go back to chapter number 16. Verse six, they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets and they've been given blood to drink as they deserve. And then I heard the altar respond, yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. I believe that these ones, this altar that's calling out are these that have been slain and they are the ones that were told, you wait a little longer and now the day has come. Listen, judgment delayed is not judgment denied. Judgment delayed is not judgment denied. Because God chooses to withhold judgment for a season does not mean that God has denied judgment justice. He's the God of justice. And that is what these people are finding out. And so those under that altar are saying, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, you are true. You have proved to be 
faithful to your character. You are a God of righteousness. You are a God of justice. You are a God of faithfulness. Now we go on in this passage, verse number eight, the fourth bowl. And the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun. And the sun was given power to scorch the people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify God. How's God gonna do that? I don't know, but when I hear this word seared, um, I think of steak. And that's a terrible picture. It's a terrible picture to have in your mind when you think of people. When you think of people created in the image of God. And that the heat gets turned up. And they're seared. There's two words that come out to my mind as I read this passage. The first word is depravity. Even at this point, when the heat is on, they still shake a fist at God and refuse to repent. That is depravity at its nth degree. But the second word that comes to mind is sovereignty. When it looks like everything's out of control, even they know that he's in control of those plagues. He's the God of sovereignty. And I would like to think that if they had turned to him at that moment in time, he would have turned the heat right off. That those who would call on his name at that moment in time would be saved. Verse 10. And the fifth angel, the fifth bowl now, poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. Men gnawed their tongues in agony and they cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. So here we have a culmination. Let me first say this. There are some that say uh, this darkness that's gonna come is on the throne of the beast uh, and they're speaking of, they would say this is just on his headquarters. I don't agree. Uh, there are those that say it is just on Babylon where he's going to be, be uh, that, that is his little kingdom. No, I think we're seeing here uh, what the majority of, of conservative scholars would agree with, that this is a worldwide darkness that's taking place because the kingdom of God has now become the kingdom of Satan. He has worldwide rule until Christ comes again. And so here you have the world plunged into absolute darkness. How dark? I don't know how dark, but I'm going to tell you, it's so dark that the Scripture said they gnaw on their tongues because of their pain. The darkest I've ever been in, my dad um, when he was a bivocational pastor, he used to be a manager on a gold mine, and he would take us down into the, the mine. We, we would drop down right at a mile under the ground, and we would go down a shaft as far as you could go, and then you'd get out, and then you'd walk along a, 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 a what would you call it, a shaft, if you would, to a, a next station where you would drop further down and then you would get to a place where you would walk to what they would call the face. And this is a place that has no electricity put to it yet, no ventilation put to it yet. And so you could only spend X amount of time there and then you'd have to get out. This is where they're advancing the mine. So you would be further than a mile and a half under the ground. And what he would always do, we would put on, he would say, okay, boys, Hold my hands, and you know how that would go. <laughs> hold hands. I'm like seven years old. Why would I want to hold your hand? You know, don't you get it? I'm a big man. It's all right. You don't want to hold hands. That's fine. Put your hands on your, on your headlamps. 
And on the count of three, we're going to turn them off. And he'd go one, two, three. It would get so dark, you could slap yourself. You wouldn't even know you slapped yourself. I mean, it was, no, I mean, that was just a joke. I mean, it was so dark. You couldn't see. It was, it was so dark, it literally felt like you could feel the darkness. And when we turned the lights back on, guess what? We were all holding hands. <laughs> I have a daughter. No, I'll not say that. The darkness is a terrible thing. Growing up as a little boy, I was very afraid of the dark. In fact, all the way through till about probably the 10th grade, I used to stand by the light switch. I used to believe there's something under my bed. And coming in, into my bedroom... There's construction happening in there, or so I'm told. I'd come into my room and I'd stand by the light switch. My bed would be there. And I'd get myself ready and uh, put my finger on the light switch. And I'd go one, two, and as I'd throw that switch, I'd run and dive for my bed because I scared something would grab my feet in the dark. I'm not trying to make light out of a dark situation, but I'm telling you, if you think that the darkness that we know is dark, you've not yet gnawed your tongue off. What a hateful God we've got. No, 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 what a God of love that he would reach out in grace to us, that he would send his only son, that whoever would believe in him would not have to ever experience this if they would only, only trust him. But instead of trusting him, according to this verse said, because they cursed the God of heaven, verse 11, because of their pains, and they refused to repent of what they had done. Verse 12, so the sixth angel pours out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its waters were dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east. And then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs, and they came out of the mouth of the dragon, mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. Now here we see that unholy trinity again. You remember, We've, we, we worship the Father, the Son, and the... Holy Spirit, in the time of the tribulation, we're going, to see the, we're going to see Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, the unholy trinity. Here we have, um, speaking of frogs, are they real frogs? No, we're, we're hearing symbolic um, talk that's being used here, because it says that they are, not that they are frogs, but it says they are the what? Three evil spirits. They looked like frogs. They're not frogs, okay? So it's not real frogs. They look like frogs. And so these are spirits, and where are they going? They're going to deceive uh, these kings. When you go to chapter 17, you will see that there are actually 10 kings that are going to, to come together for this great battle. And so the river Euphrates is dried up, making way for them to get into this, this great valley where the, the uh, battle of Armageddon is going to take place. Uh, we get it from the, the Hebrew words har Magadon, which is uh, Har, the mount, Magadon, so there's no place like that. Where do we believe it to be? Uh, Joel chapter 3, verse 2. If you boys will put Joel 3, verse 2 up on, on the screen for me, please. And Joel 3 and verse 2 uh, says that I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Uh, there I will enter into judgment against them concerning my inheritance, my people, Israel, for they scattered my people among the nations and divided my land. And so here we're going to have these kings that have, these, uh, that have been uh, incited to be brought in. And you're going to have all of these armies entering in. Uh, it's a great war that's going to take place. And 
it's going to be amazing when we get to read about that more specifically in chapter 19 with the second coming of Christ. And you're even going to realize it's really not going to be much of a battle as much as it's going to be a squashing. Uh, Christ is going to fight that battle. He's just going to squash them. And we'll, re- we'll get there in chapter 19. Boy, actually, I'm really trying to get to chapter 19 as where I want to be. But, uh, and so here we have this this. this the river Euphrates just drying up, allowing them all to come in. Verse 14 says, and they are the spirits of demons performing miraculous signs. They go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle on the great day of God Almighty. What is that great day? That is the day of the second coming when Jesus will come to set up his kingdom, that millennial kingdom that we have spoken so much about. Verse 15 is a a parenthetical passage. It is here that he is encouraging them. Behold, I come like a thief. Christ coming soon. Blessed is he who stays awake, keeps his clothes with him, so he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings together to that place. And here it is, that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Verse 17. So the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. And out of the temple came a loud voice. Who's in the temple? God, okay. So it's God speaking. From the throne saying, it is done. The uh, word that is used is gegonen, which is this word, uh, it's completion. A word of completion with further results to come, with an ongoing result. It is done. Well, what is done? We know that there's still things to come, right? We know that Christ still has to come. We know that there's a millennial kingdom that still needs to happen. We know that Satan still needs to be put into the abyss. We know that there's a rebellion that still has to take place. We know that there is the uncreating of the created order that needs to take place. We know that there's the creating of the new order. We know that there's a great white throne that still needs to take place. We know that there's still lots that needs to take place. Is it done? So what is done? The judgment, okay? His judgments, that, that, that tribulational judgment that we've spoken about, the tribulational wrath of God has now taken place. It is done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it had ever occurred since man has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split in three parts. That's incredible. The city of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. I was watching a thing on television last night. Have you all seen the the mountains in Colorado? Isn't that awesome? Can you imagine going out to Colorado and not finding those mountains? It would take a huge earthquake, wouldn't it? Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, hailstones of about a hundred pounds each fell upon men. Are you not thankful that God in his wisdom decided to make raindrops about the size of that they are today and hailstones the size they are today? Imagine if he decided when it rains to pour out like a truckload at a time, pour out like hailstones the size of a building. In his wisdom, he decided that raindrops need to be little drops and Hailstones, little hail. Sounds like a pretty wise God. And notice the effect. Can you say depravity? Hmm. And they cursed God on account of the plague and the hail because the plague was so terrible. I guess it's not a very exciting passage. So what do I take away from it? I take away several things, but here is a thought I wanna leave with you. 
our God is faithful. If he says it's going to happen, it will happen. He said that he was going to send his only son, and he did. He said that his son would die on a cross, and he did. He said that he would raise him from the dead, and he did. He said that he would ascend on high, and he did. And he said that he is going to take us to be with him, and he will. And he said that these things that I've just spoken about will happen, and they will. So given his track record of faithfulness, what does this prompt me toward as a believer? Well, what it prompts me toward is two things. The first thing it prompts me toward is to live for him today. Not because I'm afraid I will lose my salvation, for I know that this is not possible. I believe that when you've come to Christ, that you are safe and secure in his hand. But it prompts me to understand the great, great gift that I have received, salvation, and I want to live for him. But the second thing that it prompts me towards as a believer is to share the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Could I ask you on this day, when last have you shared this gospel with somebody else? Do you know that everyone that you come into contact with is headed somewhere? Doesn't matter what the color of their skin doesn't matter the language that they speak. It does not matter what state they come from. It does not matter what country they live in. All that matters is that they have all been created in the image of God. And that God loves them so much that he would sacrifice his one and only son so that they can call on his name and be saved. Would you care enough to share Jesus with him? Would you care enough just to put your arm around them and say, hey, where are you headed? And when they say, I'm on my way to Ingalls, say no. I want to know where are you headed when the lights go out. And they may say, I don't know. I've never really thought about that. And you can sit down and tell them about a God that loves them so much that he would die for them. Well, you may not even feel comfortable with doing that. You may say, you know what? I don't know how to do that. That's okay. You may want to just invite them to come to church. You may want to invite them to go to lunch and invite me along. I'm coming if you're paying. <laughs> but you know, we can tell them we can tell them about the greatest, greatest thing that ever, ever happened. The greatest thing that will ever happen. That God became man and died so that man would never have to die. Imagine that. Trusted. You've been entrusted with the gospel. You, you are ambassadors for Christ. Don't let this day go by without examining yourself and saying, you know what? I am faithful to share the gospel. Maybe I'm not. And God, help me. Help me. 
you want to be equipped toward that? Our adult Sunday school class started today, in fact, with a new series being equipped of becoming good stewards of the gospel. How to share your faith. So I encourage you, if you want to be, learn how to sh- share your faith, come 945 Sunday mornings. Let me pray with you. You bow your heads and let's pray. Lord, we're thankful to be in your house this morning. We're blessed. We are so blessed in this country to be able to just come and open your word and study your word and be encouraged by who you are, our sovereign, loving, merciful, gracious, heavenly Father. Thank you. Help us today to live for you. Help us to share the gospel. Before I say amen, while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, is there someone in this room, maybe you don't know that you're saved. Maybe you've heard all this talk about a Jesus and you've heard all about this God that would send his only son for you and you've really never trusted him. Today is the, you've, you've felt the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Is there anyone in here that you need to come to Christ today? You want to say, I repent of my sin and I turn to Jesus. I don't want to live for myself anymore. I just want to live for Jesus. I want to give my life to him. I know that he died as my substitution on that cross. I want to give my life to Jesus. Is there anyone like that in this room? If so, would you just raise your hand high up? I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'd just like to chat with you after the service. Is there anyone? You just raise your hand. So Father, I'm thankful for all that you've done. I'm thankful for all that you're doing. I pray your blessings upon each one in this room. I pray you'll pour out your blessings on each home that is represented here today. And this I pray in Christ's name, amen.